Ready to go. All right. Is this a great country or what? Uh, okay. Let's move this out of here. Okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful. In on them the fire of thy love and send forth thy spirit. They shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, by that same spirit to have right judgment in all things, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome. Uh, we're... I had an announcement this morning that I thought was significant. I had no major tractor thoughts, so I, we won't be off on a tangent like we were last week. Half the class was a tractor thought, so we only got like three verses done. So I didn't have any. You can talk about traffic. Uh, yeah, we did talk about that, but that was before we started. Um, wanted to remind everybody that the uh, inclement weather plan has changed from years in the past. We do not go with Fairfax County. You know, Fairfax County sees if there's snowing in Nebraska and they cancel all our schools. So we now go based on Father DeSalle's call, sends out an email. I'll get it and I'll send it to you. But just watch for the call and be prudent. Even if it's not canceled, if it's bad weather, just don't come. But but they are no longer going with, with Fairfax. Um, I also wanted to mention that this is Bible study and and it, it's cr it's critical to me, that we use Bible study as a means of expanding the faith. When we got our master's degrees, um, it was a typical master's degree. I think it usually takes like three years. And, and the issues were, uh, the discipline was what you chose to make the bulk of your study. So I chose scripture and Beverly chose spirituality. But the, the rest of the course was core curriculum. That's what everybody had. And it was theology. And Catholic theology is the basis for which our faith has been kind of clarified over the century. It hadn't changed, same teachings that were taught back in the beginning, but it's very important for me when I run across something that gives us the theological implications of our faith, I want to go and talk about it. And that happens every once in a while. And it's very important to look at the early church and see how the early church saw things, see how the early church fathers saw them, and then how they impacted and how these things have been evolved over the over the centuries and how we can be so comfortable. Um, yesterday, you may or may not have gone to daily mass and may or may not know of the readings, but it was interesting yesterday, we're in Mark's gospel and we were looking at this issue when the the, the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said, why don't your disciples fast? We fast twice a week. John the Baptist disciples, they're fasting. Why are your guys that are following you not fasting? And Jesus gave the response, you know, when you go to a wedding, you don't fast. But once the groom and the bride are off on their honeymoon and the wedding's over, then there's time for doing other more serious things like fasting. And then he gave the, the analogy or the, the, the parable of sowing, why you would not sow a new patch, new cloth on an old piece of cloth. Because as you know, in those days, there certainly wasn't stuff they put in fabrics today to keep them from shrinking. So if you had cotton and you washed it, it would shrink. So if you put a new patch on an old shrunken cloth and it shrinks, it'll tear the hole and make it worse. But the other one was wine. And that was really interesting if you know the culture. Um, that they didn't have a lot of bottles. So the way you stored wine, you made it, and then you stored it in wine skins. And wine skins, I think, I'm not sure what animal, but I think it's the stomach of an animal. I think it's like a goat stomach and they clean it all out and it's very pliable like a stomach. And then you put new wine in it and the wine expands because it ferments and it, and it, it gets a lot of gas. Well, if you use an old skin, which is dry, and then fill it with wine, then it can't, it can't expand, so it tears. So that was his argument. Well, I've heard that before and I've heard a lot of homilies on it, but I was reading the conversation with God yesterday morning 
And it really struck me. I want to read this to you because it really gave me an insight into those two parables that I'd never really thought of before. And he says, the church is holy and produces fruits of holiness in a great number of the different ways the Old Testament announces and prefigures everything that's to take place in the New Testament. Now we know that you've always heard the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New. So the New Testament is the fullness and fulfillment of the Old Testament. And he said, Christ shows in his teaching the contrast between the spirit he brings and the spirit of Judaism at his time. That's why it's so important for us to study this in the time of Jesus. What was the spirit of Judaism? How were they worshiping in his time? And how is Jesus different? And that's what this author is telling us. So the new spirit, which is what we're seeing with Christ, will not be like a patch added to something old. We're not patching the Old Testament. You see that? We're not, we're, we're, Jesus didn't come to patch up the Old Testament. But rather it is to complete and def, a, define a new beginning, which replaces the provisions, the provisions and imperfect realities of the ancient revelation. Like new wine, the newness of Christ's message is fullness. It does not fit into the mold of the old law. No one puts new wine in old wineskins. His listeners well understood the figures and images. The Lord used to speak about the kingdom of heaven, which we talked about. It's not the kingdom of heaven, pie in the sky. It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of Israel. It's the church. So the kingdom of church, say church, um, is different. So he said the, ch the church is a new garment without rent or tear. And she's a new vessel prepared to receive the spirit of Christ. See that image? So this is what we're studying, is this new spirit. And he said, she will generously carry the message and saving the strength of her Lord to the ends of the earth, so long as men shall exist. With the ascension, once uh, one stage in the revelation is closed with Pentecost, a new age, the time of the church, commences. The church is the mystical body of Christ, which continues the sanctifying action of Jesus, principally throughout the sacraments. The church doctrine enlightens our minds, brings us to know the Lord, enables us to converse intimately with him and to love him. This is why the church, our mother, has never admitted differences in matter of doctrine by teaching a partial or deformed truth. She's always remained vigilant so as to keep the faith in all its purity and in this faith, she has taught throughout the world. Thanks to her unfailing faithfulness, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're able to know the doctrine taught by Jesus without any change or variations of the sense in which he taught it. From the day of Pentecost to the present day, we continue to hear Christ's voice. So that's what we're listening to. Christ's voice, the new wine, the new way to worship. Sure, it's still the Jewish tradition. Sure, it's still... Jesus is, is a Jew, his father is God, but it's it's totally revolutionary and new. I just thought that was amazing because it gave me some insights that, that I really had never seen that that uh, parable used to as a means of explaining the faith today. And I was telling a class this morning, years and years ago when we were teaching, Beverly and I were teaching high school CCD at Nativity. It was right during this time when the March for Life was going and everything was getting excited about going in the march and so on. And we sent out and did a little survey and we asked the 11th and 12th graders way back then, if they thought the teachings of the church on pro-life, the pro-life teaching of the church would change in their lifetime to meet more in line with the culture. And about 75% of the kids said, yes, the church will eventually catch up to this modern way. No, it's an immutable truth. It's not changing. Christ gave it to us. It's always going to be true. And I just thought that was interesting because so many times you think, well, everything's going to change. We'll get a new interpretation. But we've had this battle all along. And we're going to look at some uh, briefly one of the major heresies that happened in the early church. We're still battling with things. But the structure, the way the hierarchy has been set up, the way the ecclesia is functioning and has functioned for 2000 years, those things are always worked out. So right now there's some disagreement with the Vatican and this and that and this committee and that committee, and it's awkward, but it'll all get worked out. Eventually the Holy Spirit will guide the governing body who, who are the gathered bishops when called for a council. 
to resolve an issue, it's always been resolved and it's always been sustained throughout all the time. So we've got great hope. So that was, I thought was, was interesting. Now today uh, we celebrated the feast of St. Anthony of the Desert. And uh, Anthony of the Desert was very much like John the Baptist. I mean, he, he lived in the desert for a long time. He lived to be a hundred and something. And he, 105, yeah, he, he was an amazing guy. And Father was talking about him this morning, uh, Father um, uh, uh, Monsignor, I can't even think, it was Dempsey, was talking about it. He was talking about how he, Anthony, fought the Arian heresy, which was raging during his lifetime. And we'll look at that in just a second. But uh, we, we're going to see that as he discussed it, but more important as it comes up in the class. So the last class we looked very, very briefly. I had a lengthy explanation of my tractor thought about the role of history and how we become better Catholics by knowing our history and our background. And then we didn't have a lot of time. And so we talked about why Father Sebastian used Matthew as a principal source, because it's the richest and it's the most related to the Old Testament and closest to what the people of the first century were worshiping. We also looked at the reference of Isaiah and showed you that Matthew didn't use Malachi in his reference to the baptism. And we saw how John the Baptist was carrying his baptismal mission to the Jordan now down near the Dead Sea and how the Essenes were right there and how he may have been an Essene. And we discussed Matthew was a good Jew, could not use the word God, even in the idea of the kingdom of God. So he didn't use the word kingdom of God, Matthew, in deference to the Pharisees. So he called what we call the kingdom of God, which is a, a way of saying the church. He called it the kingdom of heaven. But it's not heaven pie in the sky after death. That's what we have the image when you read, oh, this is about the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's after we die. No, this is about the church. That's what Matthew's talking about. Just like Mark. Mark called it the kingdom of God. Luke called it the kingdom of God. David was talking about the, the kingdom of David and the success of the kingdom of Israel. That is being extended through the temple to the church through Christ. So we saw that last week. And we saw that even in the Old Testament, they used kingdom of God. But again, by this time in the first century, they were so afraid. And I'll show you why in a minute. So today we're going to start with chapter, continue with chapter three of Matthew's gospel. <clears throat> and just to set it in context, last week we started, we didn't do very much, but we just saw in the beginning in verse one, he said that John was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. We know it's down near the Dead Sea. And he was pre preaching a baptism of repentance, not salvation. We're saved by baptism now. Baptism removes all sin, both personal and original. But his baptism was just to cause you to want to repent identify your sins and seek the guidance of the law to seek forgiveness. And that was through animal sacrifice. So the people were coming down there in droves. They were coming down from Jerusalem, down the hill, like they were going to Jericho and they were stopping by and being baptized by droves. And then he quoted from Isaiah that he was one, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So that was from Isaiah. That was a quote from Matthew. So that's where we left off. We didn't do very well last week. I apologize. Well, then we said in verse four, he said what he wore. We saw that John the Baptist wore camel's hair, leather. This is sort of the Isaiah, uh, Isaiah figure. And he uh, was a rough guy, lived on a locust and ate honey. So now we start with verse five. And that's what we're going to pick up today. And he said, um, talking about what's happening, get your idea of John the Baptist down near the top of the Dead Sea in the Jordan before what it looks like today, because today all the water is pulled off by the Palestinians on one side and the Jews on the other for crops. So by the time you get down to the Dead Sea, it's just a trickle. There's not a, it's not a raging river. But at the time of Christ, it was probably a pretty deep river. And I imagine that Jesus was immersed. I imagine he went in kind of up to his waist and people were dunking them under the water for their baptism. So there's John down there. And he said, then went out to him, meaning from Jerusalem, the people were coming in droves. Then went out from him to, uh, to went out to him 
Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the regions around the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So they are recognizing their sinfulness and they are seeking the ways to restore it. Now, why is all this happening? Again, because at the first century, the Jews were desperately trying to make things so righteous that God would return. Remember, 500 years since the Ark of the Covenant was taken out, 500 years since the glory cloud left the temple, 500 years since the last anointed Messiah Christ, the anointed one, was taken off into captivity. And in those 500 years, there hasn't been a king or a glory cloud or an Ark of the Covenant, Jerusalem. They built the temple. They built Jerusalem back. They're all set. But as we'll go again and look at Malachi, they're not ready. They're not living righteously. And John is preparing them. Come down and recognize your sinfulness. And then maybe the Messiah will come. So that's where they were. So uh, then he goes on in verse 7. He said, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, imagine they had the ordinary people, shopkeepers, shepherds, fishermen, all these kind of guys. But are you talking? Are you kidding me? Sadducees? This is a ruling class? This is the aristocrat of society that's running the temple? And the Pharisees with this political party that's running all over the country trying to make people holy? They were coming? That's what he says. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, <laughs> You brood of vipers. Father always says, that wasn't very ecumenical. <laughs> you brood of Viker, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So you're getting again this idea from Malachi that there's going to be wrath, there's going to be fire, there's going to be cleansing before the coming of the Messiah. And that's what he's sensing. So he said, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear the fruit that benefits repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. But John says, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, even now, as you come down, he said, the ax is laid to the root of the tree. What does that mean? The tree's being cut down. Judaism is in danger. And we saw it in Malachi. Every tree board, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's pretty powerful language to speak to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So let's look real quickly at what Father Sebastian talked about here. They were the two most important religious groups. There are four really groups that you deal with in the New Testament of, of people acting in a religious way. The most elite were the Sadducees. We'll look at them in a minute. But the next most powerful group coming out of the Maccabean revolt, being very patriotic with a very, very devout and good idea is how, how do we get the people, all of Israel, to live in such a way that God will be happy? And if we make God happy, he's going to send us a Messiah. He's going to bring us a glory cloud. And he's going to return the Ark of the Covenant. Now, how do we do that? How do we get there? That was their question. And their conclusion um, is that they needed to get everyone to live the law. First five books of the Bible, 613 regulations. Perfectly. If we can get every American citizen to go to Mass every Sunday, and be honest and, and receive communion and go to co confession, God will be happy. Let's see us do that. Let's, that's their goal. That's what they're trying to do. And it's interesting the way they did it. They would go into every town and village and live there. And they would get to know all the people. And then they would watch all the people. Whenever they saw somebody do something that they thought was against the law, then they would confront them and then if they didn't comply with what they wanted them to do, and I'll give you an example in a minute, then they tell all their neighbors, you have to ostracize these people. Tremendous social pressure was being brought 
by the Pharisees all over the Israel. And I'll give you an example. One of the things you're supposed to do is give 10% to the, to the temple. That was a rule. But it was the first of 10% of everything that you grow. So if you're a farmer, the first 10% of your fruits, by law, go to the temple. That's That was part of the law of God, giving to, to God. And, the, and if you have animals, the first land that opens the womb of the mother lamb, you give to the temple in sacrifice. They were watching and they would say, oh, well, you know, so-and-so has got an herb garden in their yard. Not, not, we're not talking about corn or what. It's always talking about corn. The corn doesn't grow in the Middle East. I don't know where we get this idea of corn. It's in the Bible all the time. Corn's an American crop. I, I don't know where that comes from. But anyway, well, let's say wheat. So you're a wheat farmer or barley. If you have a crop that's fairly good, then you get 10% and you take a temple, right? But herbs, you're growing dill, mustard. You know, I mean, really? Ah, oh, you didn't give 10%. Uh, you didn't give 10% of your deal. You violated the law. Ostracize them. That's what they were doing. And it was crazy. They were driving the people crazy. So that's who they, that's who they were. The Pharisees, again, if we could get all, all sin wiped out. So how do we do that? All right. So we have 10 commandments. That's the center of the law. Um, keep the Sabbath holy. Okay, that's that's pretty good. Well, let's make sure we don't work on the Sabbath at all. Okay, so let's put a hedge around that. Let's say you can't walk a thousand meters or a thousand yards on Sabbath. That's a hedge. And and you can't go more, you, you can't go outside that area for any reason on the Sabbath. And if you do, you violate the commandment and you commit a sin. So they put hedges around hedges around hedges because if you didn't violate the hedge there's no way you're going to violate the law you see that so that's what they're doing and this is what he's saying they're trying to get all israel to follow it perfectly and he said if you it, there's no one in the law does it say carrying your paddle on the sabbath was a sin it says you can't work on the sabbath now is carrying the sabbath carrying your, your pallet you're a paralytic you have been healed by jesus he tells you to pick up your pallet and go home how is that a sin? Oh, yeah, because he should know better. Don't come on Sabbath to be healed. Wait till the day after. Come at six o'clock on Saturday night. Then you can be healed. Don't ask Jesus to heal you on the Sabbath. That's work, is it? Jesus said, if your animal falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, don't you pull him out? Well, of course you do. Don't you take your animals out for watering? Of course you do. This woman's hemorrhage for nine or 18 years. Don't you think I can heal her on the Sabbath? Oh, no, that's work. And my favorite is it's true today. If you go to Israel, go to a big hotel, and it's Sabbath, you cannot push a button on an elevator to stop on a floor. So the elevator stop automatically on every floor going up and on every floor going down. So if you're on the 10th floor, you get on the elevator in the lobby, and you have to stop at every one of the floors till you get to the 10th floor and vice versa coming down. Because pushing that button, uh, that's work. I remember, I think it was Menachem Begin, who went to the funeral of, of the leader of Egypt when he had been murdered. And he couldn't walk the, in the funeral procession because it was more than a thousand yards. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, and I, I was telling the class this morning, we look at this, I remember when I grew up in India, uh, there were temples and they had prayer rolls. So they'd write a prayer on it in their language. And then if you went by the temple and you just rolled it, you kind of got credit for the, that prayer, right? So it'll, we look at that and say, oh, that's stupid. Well, how fast do we say the Lord's Prayer sometimes? How many times do we say the Our Father, at, I mean, the, 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 the rosary at rapid speed? It's not much different. We do the same thing. But the Jews have said, I've, I've been told, I don't know this for sure, but I've been told that there, there is a part of the law that said, if you travel over water, your distance doesn't matter. So they put Tupperware boxes with water under their seat in the airplane. Or the one I like is they have awnings between apartment houses. So if they have a whole big apartment complex with multiple houses, you can go three miles and never go outside because you move from house to house under awning. I, I don't know, but it, it sounds ridiculous, but we do a lot of the same things. We get so Pavlovian, we just try to... But anyway, that's what they were doing. So 
Does it say that you can't take your pellet? The other one is, does it say eating grain of wheat on the Sabbath is a sin? But you saw those Pharisees, they were watching. Jesus and his disciples got up one morning. He said, oh, let's go over here. They're walking through, they're hungry, walking through the grain field, most likely wheat. They're taking some of it, they're eating it. And the Pharisees jump out of the bushes and attack them. You know, it's like, that's a lie. No, it's not in the law. My favorite, again, I've told you this each time. The guy that says, I've given all my money to the temple. I can't take care of my parents. Jesus got really mad at him. He said, the commandment is honor your father and mother. This silly law that says if you give your money to the temple means you can't use it for anything else and you don't take care of your parents and they're sick and dying because they can't have any of your money. Which is more important, the law that says honor your father and mother or this man-made rule, this hedge that they've come up with? He got really furious with them. So that's what's going on. Now, Father said this, I love this. He said, they believed that if the disciples picked grain on the Sabbath, before long they'd be cranking up their John Deere's to go out and, and, and harvest the grain. So that's their mentality. Okay, the Sadducees, they were, they were the guys that ran the country. They were the Sanhedrin, 770 guys under the high priest. They thought that the law of Leviticus, particularly as it applied to the sacrificial system, was important. And the sacrificial system, Father called it the sacrificial engine. It was a, it was a machine. And here's the way it worked. Let's just take Passover. Passover from Exodus, God told Moses, put this in the law. You'll remember Passover every year, and you'll all procure a lamb, just like the people in Egypt did, one per family. Families are too small. You can go together, and you'll prepare the lamb. You'll prepare it a certain way. You'll cook it and eat it and be prepared to, as the people of Israel were prepared to leave in the middle of the night after the last plague, which is the angel of death that killed the firstborn and all men and animals, except for those who had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and they were the Hebrew people. So we'll do this every year. Guess where you can go to do, guess where you must go to do that? Jerusalem. You can't do this in Galilee. You can't have a Passover meal in Galilee. You can only do it in Jerusalem. So guess where you're gonna get the lamb? You're gonna get it near the temple. Well, if the lamb has an imperfection, you can't offer it in sacrifice. Who's gonna determine whether the lamb has an imperfection? Priest. So these shepherds, where, where are they? Where are the shepherds? They're five miles away in Bethlehem. That's where the shepherds are. They're professional shepherds. They're not sheep owners. They're just guys that are keeping the sheep for the people to be sold in the temple for Passover. Thousands of them. Now, if they get in the gate and get in the temple, you're going to pay to convert your money to temple money. And then you're going to use temple money to buy a sheep without blemish to offer Passover. You can buy the same sheep outside the gate before he's turned it over to the temple for half the price. But if they find out that's what happened, that sheep will have a have a discount, will have a problem. There'll be something wrong with it. I mean, you can always find something wrong. So you see how that works? So they're making lots of money. I mean, I'm not judging. I'm not saying they were crooks, but they, they were interested in the sacrificial system because it made a lot of money. And that's when, when Jesus came in there and turned over the money changers table and kicked all the animals out. It's like, whoa this is a threat to our system because everybody in addition to that all year long if you identified that you've committed a sin or if a priest or rabbi tells you you've committed a sin and you violated the law you had to go to jerusalem and you had to offer that sacrifice as it was required in the law often it required a lamb if you were very very poor like mary and joseph it required turtle doves now they didn't count they don't cost anything or a couple pennies but a lamb, that was expensive. So you see that. So that was that they were, the Sadducees were keen on making this go. And if they offered, they thought if they offered the proper sacrifice, then God would be happy because they were offering these sacrifices for their sins. Therefore, their sins would be taken care of and God would come back. And so they wanted the, the temple to function. They wanted this system to go on. They didn't care much about Herod because he was a foreigner. They certainly didn't care about Caesar because he was off in Rome. So they were running the country. They were very comfortable. And here John the Baptist sees these guys, Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he says, you should be telling the people about their sins. They shouldn't be coming down here and me, this wild man. That's your job. Why aren't you doing your job? Why aren't you calling them to repent? And he was really upset with them. 
And so they are the ones that should have been causing these, these things to happen. Instead, they were worried about hedges or they were worried about sacrifices. So John gives an exhortation here. So that was setting the stage for one of the most important passages, not because it turns out to be in all four of the Gospels. Many stories are in two or more Gospels. Some are in three. Occasionally, they're in four. It doesn't make it more important, but you know it's really important if all four of the Gospel writers writes about it. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke each discuss the baptism of Jesus, and John does too, way, way, way later. So this is a very, very significant moment. And when is it happening? At the beginning of his public ministry. We heard the infancy story, Matthew and Luke. Okay, that's fine. But now we've got this rabbi. Now, most of us role-playing this first century Jew, we are now about 30 to 40 years after Jesus rose from the dead. You most likely didn't ever meet or see Jesus. Most likely you didn't run into him in the temple. Most likely you didn't see him being crucified. Your parents might have. Certainly your grandparents might have. Because the generation was usually 40 years. You usually were dead with that when you made 40. So they weren't real familiar, but they had heard these stories because the stories had been passed on orally. And this, these churches had been started and people were meeting but now we're getting written documents. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are deciding to write it down to their respective audience. So now we're part of this group in Jerusalem. We're meeting in these houses. We're doing this on Sunday. And now we're getting this scroll. And we're listening to Matthew explain what we've been hearing about all along. And he is going to try his very, very best to convince us, Jews, Jewish Christians, convert from the Hebrew faith to Christianity that Jesus was the Mosaic Messiah. He was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And you're going to see all this Judaism being played out because it's very important for Matthew to convince the Jews that this was the anointed one. He was the Messiah. You missed it, but you can still join by what? Being baptized. The sacrament of initiation. Now, I put a list of the sacraments up because I think it's really important for us to pause in a situation like this and to see what this means. What is a sacrament? And I didn't grow up in the Catholic Church. I've been a Catholic 47 years, but I didn't grow up and learn the Baltimore Catechism like Beverly did. But anybody our age who had grown up in the faith, you said, what's a sacrament? They just rattled the definition. Sacrament is signed, instituted by Christ to give grace. Everybody knows that. What does that mean? First of all, what's a sign? Most signs, although a stop sign on my road doesn't mean anything anymore, are supposed to tell you something. The sign says stop, red sign. You don't even have to read English. Symbol says stop. A sign points to something. So a sacrament points to this expression of our faith. It points to Jesus Christ. It points to God. It points to love. It points to our faith. It was instituted by Christ. All seven sacraments, we can identify and show you where it's either directly implied or whether you are directly pointed out or whether it's implied, as some of the others are, by Christ or through his teachings, that these are the seven signs pointing to the way we receive what? Grace. And what is grace? Grace is the love of God that enables us to get to heaven sanctifying grace, the grace that makes you a saint. Where do you get it? You get it through the sacraments and you get it through prayer. And that's what you want to die with. If you grew up like Beverly's, her mom probably told her a thousand times, you know, offer it up, offer it up. Um, you, you want to die in a state of grace. I've talked about this before. You want to die happy death. A happy death is when you are conscious. The priest comes. He hears your last confession. And he gives you the sacrament of the sick, which includes an anointing. And you receive a, a plenary indulgence through the papal blessing that's part of the sacrament, which means your sins are forgiven and the temporal punishment 
is paid for through the indulgence, which means you should be able to go directly to heaven upon your death. Something you should pray for. Pray for it. If you die in a car accident, doesn't mean you won't go to heaven. If you don't have this, doesn't mean you're not. But to have this is phenomenal. And I've witnessed all of these. I've witnessed all of these sacraments. I've been involved in ceremonies where all of these work. Baptism, a lot. I don't can't tell you how many people go to RCA, get married, have children, invite us to the Charles Baptist. So it's a great honor. I, it's a privilege to go and be part of a of a, an infant's baptism. But it's it's truly amazing what's being said, what's going on, what the symbols are, what is happening, and where does it come from? It comes from right here. What we're going to read next. It's an amazing event. Penance, of course. To me, next to Eucharist is the most beautiful sacrament of all because your sins are forgiven and you hear the tangible voice of Christ through the priest absolving you. And I've told you this before as a process, and I never knew that Jesus had, had fully absolved me. I thought so, but I would always remind him that I'm still sorry for those other things that I told him I was sorry for the last time. And then added to that, I had these things and I'm still sorry about them. But in confession, I once it's absolved, it's gone. It's, it's amazing. It's truly amazing. Of course, the Eucharist is the food for the soul. It is, it is the Passover meal, right? The sacrifice is Christ. The priest is Christ. Christ gives us his body and blood. We consume it. What happens at Passover meal? The lamb is slaughtered ritually. Blood's put on the doorposts of the house. We eat the lamb. Eating the lamb makes us a part of the sacrifice. We are consuming the sacrifice and making it a part of us by eating it. Eucharist is the same. We receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ every time we receive the Eucharist with him being the high priest and offering the sacrifice himself. And he is the sacrifice. It's just, it's amazing. Confirmation is beautiful. The bishop comes. He's a descendant of the apostles. It's like one of the apostles coming and he holds his hands over the hundred kids that are all in robes and he calls down the Holy Spirit. It's it's magnificent. And the mass is beautiful, especially here. The choir, but when the bishop comes in, I mean, this is an apostle. This is one of the apostles walking down the center aisle of our church, giving us blessing. It's just amazing. Matrimony is between the, the, the instruments of the matter, the, the um, ministers of the, of the sacrament of the couple. You exchange the vows to each other, and the priest is a witness. You know, people say, Father DeSalle married us. Well, first of all, he cannot get married. So obviously he didn't marry, marry you. He witnessed your marriage. You married each other. The, the vows are between you. But I'll tell you, the sacrament you get in addition to, in, in addition to um, sanctifying grace, you get sacramental grace. So for each one of these sacraments, you get the grace of the sacrament added to the sacramental grace that you get. Holy orders, we've seen bishops ordain our priests, we were there when Father DeSalle was ordained. There were 30 priests that time. It was amazing. It was Father Scalia was there. It was, it was truly amazing. I may have told you this, but right after it was over, you went down in the basement of the church. We had a reception, you know, cookies and Kool-Aid. But we were there in this very distinguished, at, my, at that point for us, elderly couple was there. And we were standing there waiting for the priests to come down that have just ordained because you get their first blessing and they usually give you a prayer card that you keep. So you get the first blessing of a priest, which is really a, an awesome thing. It doesn't mean you get the only one, but he, he blesses all the people that come that time. So a lot of people got his first blessing. Well, this couple happened to be Judge and Mrs. Scalia. So we're standing there with them as their son comes down and I met his brother and his brother at that point he has, I think they had nine children. His brother was um, an army first lieutenant, just graduated ranger school. He had sunburn all over him, short hair. He's, he looks, and he told me this story. He said, you know, years and years ago, dad had all of us, we were somewhere gathered. We may have been at dinner or somewhere getting ready to watch TV. And dad looked over the crowd, nine children, I think it was. And he said, out of this clan, I better get one army officer and one priest. And he said, today, this is fulfilled. I'm the army officer. My brother, Paul, is the priest. It was so cool. You could, and, the, and the Scalia's were just delightful people. They were just 
wonderful, cordial. You could just speak to them. And then I always had this image. Father Scalia, as I've heard many of his talks, he said on Saturday, he'd line the whole family up to go to confession. Can you imagine uh -huh. the whole nine children and the, the justice of the Supreme Court and his wife all in line to go to confession? What a sight, what a what a great faith we have. You know, this is he was so cool. But anyway, holy orders and then the sacrament of the sick. I told you this before I mentioned it this morning. I'll never forget what it was like when we were confronted with Beverly having to be emergent surgery on her colon in the middle of the night, unprepared, unthought of, and being able to call a priest at three o'clock in the morning at Fort Belvoir, who showed up in the emergency room, in our little room, heard her confession privately, and then invited me in to share in the sacrament of the sick, giving Beverly confidence and me confidence that if anything would go wrong in this emergency surgery, and it certainly could have, then everything that could possibly have been done for her soul to be ready to go with a happy death immediately to heaven had been done. What a, what a great feeling, both of us, the confidence that it gave. So these are amazing things, and it comes from right here. So I've gone off too long, but it's what happened this morning. <laughs> But anyway, let's look at this moment. Let's look. Did Jesus need to be baptized? No. But what is he doing here? He's raising this ceremony, this celebration, this, this sacrament. He's raising it to a level of one of the seven sacraments. And it's the sacrament of initiation. Initiation is baptism, confirmation, Holy Eucharist. In the Eastern Church, they give all three, whether the child is an infant or whether it happens to an adult. In RCIA, the adults get all three at the Easter Vigil. So they're all three the sacraments of initiation. When we're in the Holy Land, we went to a Palestinian mass and in, in Arabic. And during communion, this father walks up with a four-year-old in his arms, and the priest breaks off a piece of the host and gives it to the child. And, I went, and he said, no, that's our custom. We, we confirm, baptize, confirm, and give communion at the same initiation. That's what it used to be until. Anyway, so it was really marvelous. So let's look at this, what's happening here. We're looking at verse 11. And so John has said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Now we know Jesus is John the Baptist's cousin. We know that from Luke's gospel. And we know uh, this, so most likely they knew each other, but it's still, if you grow up with your cousin and he's a carpenter and he's up in Nazareth and he's doing all this stuff, how, how could he suddenly be the Messiah? I mean, it's kind of, you know, even, I can see where there's questions. The thing that I'm not sure about is when John later sends his disciples to go to Jesus and say, go and ask him if he's the one. I don't think that was so much John asking if Jesus was the one as much as it was telling his disciples to go and then follow Jesus, because many of them did. Certainly John and Andrew did. So anyway, he said, I baptize you in water and pence, but who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we're going to see that in Malachi. His winnowing fork, now winnowing fork is the, is the way you, in those days, separated the wheat from the chaff. You know, wheat comes in a, we'll call it chaff. It's sort of an outer garment, if you will. And to get to the grain of wheat, you have to get rid of that because it's worthless. It's tasteless. It's, it's just a container. So today, machines do all that. But in those days, they would take these forks and take all the grain, the wheat, and throw them up in the air, and the wind would blow. And since the chaff is lighter than the grain, the grain would fall down, and the chaff would be blown away. So that's what a winnowing fork was. It's a big fork to throw the wheat up in the air. Usually um, these places would be on top of flat hills, like on the Temple Mount. That's what it was originally before they built the temple there. So that the wind would be blowing across it. There'd always be wind and you could separate the wheat from the chaff. So, he had a, so his winnowing fork, meaning Jesus' winnowing fork is in his hand, meaning he's going to measure you. Are you wheat or are you chaff? He's going to throw you up. And if you fly away with the wind, you're chaff and you're going to be burned. See that? He said, his winnowing fork in his hand, and he's going to clear the thrashing floor, and he will gather his wheat in the granaries, and the chaff he will burn with unquenching fire. And then Jesus came 
from Galilee to the Jordan. So he comes down and John to, to John to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him saying to him, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness, be a righteous person is someone who fulfilled the law to the letter. And then he consented. So Jesus is going to be baptized in this image. All right, so the fire image is coming right out of Mal Malachi. I always call it Malachi because that's what Father Sebastian did. The, the wonderful women in my Bible study are all English majors and they're always look at these stupid accents and say I'm pronouncing it wrong. I don't care. You know, I was taught by a by a professor one time the way you the way you pronounce biblical words is with confidence because nobody knows. But anyway, here's what Malachi says. Think of this. Now this is the guy just before he was the last of the real prophets. The people are saying we've waited 500 years. Why hasn't the Messiah come? Why is the glory cloud back? What's going on? And Malachi said, look, you guys aren't ready. You're not righteous. You're not living the life that would cause God to want to come and be among you. And here's why you don't want him to come because you're not ready. He said, behold, the day comes burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. So that if it leave them neither root nor branch, but for you who fear the name of the Lord, the name, the son of righteousness shall rise and it's healing in its wings. And you shall go forth leaping like a calf from the stall and you shall tread down the wicked and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day. And I, and when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servants, Moses, the statutes, the ordinances I commanded him at Horeb, all of Israel. Behold, I will send Elijah, the prophet before you. The great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children, or to children of their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. So you better be ready for this. You are not ready yet, because it's going to be a hard day. It's not going to be joy because you're going to be judged. And that's what he's saying. So the fire is right out of Malachi. Again, righteousness in Matthew's gospel was the fulfillment of every aspect of the law. What the Pharisees warned. Righteous men kept the law perfect. We say Joseph was a righteous man. The Pharisees, that meant they, they included all of the Pentateuch and all the scriptures, including the prophets. They accused everything else with the prophets. So you had the law, the prophets. The Sadducees only had the law, first five books of the Bible. So the phrase means the word of God as expressed in the scripture will be fulfilled at that point. So verse 16 and 17, we get the, the baptism. We see him being baptized. He said, and when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened and he saw this, this is John, he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. That's the image of the dove landing on Jesus as he's coming out of the water. And alighting on him and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. That's the Trinity. The Trinity is New Testament. There was no Trinitarian formula in the Old Testament. There was a spirit of God, but there was nothing about the son. Here you have Jesus, the son of God, being baptized by John, coming out of the water, the dove as the image of the Holy Spirit descending upon him. But that's not the first time. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, but it was this image. And then you hear the voice of God from the cloud. Somebody asked me this morning, who all heard it? I think everybody there heard it. I don't know. But there's the Trinity. We're now seeing in the opening story of chapter three of Matthew's gospel of the public life of Jesus. First thing we're going to hear is Jesus establishing the presence of the Trinity. And this is going to be a problem right away. I'll show you right quick. Now, this anointing image, real quick, just to show you, is from uh, 1 Samuel 10 and 1 Samuel 16. 
and I don't want to have time to read all of it, but 1 Samuel 10 is a story of Samuel the prophet, who is Hannah's son. Remember Hannah? She had the son and she gave him the temple. He grew up with Eli in the temple. All right, he's now the prophet. And he is now, he took a, when Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head, this is the anointing of Saul. Saul was selected by God to be the first king. They won the king. He said, okay, I'll give you a king and I will anoint him. He is the Messiah, the anointed one. He is the Christ, the anointed one, Greek for Messiah. And he said, he poured oil on it. And he said, has not the Lord anointed you to be the prince over the people of Israel? Now, 16, six chapters later, after Saul screws up, you're going to see the same thing happen with Samuel when he selects David. So he goes to Bethlehem, they're having a ceremony, they offer a cow in sacrifice. And then he says to the father, uh, bring me your sons. God will tell me which one's going to be the king. And they all, they're, they're right out of Hollywood casting. They're all perfect for kings. They all look like kings. By the way, I remember first time I saw Bishop Keating, I thought, my gosh, that's right out of central casting. He looked like a bishop. He was, was tall and straight and had gray hair and just, he was regal. He was really neat like a bishop. But these guys were that. So, so Samuel's there and he goes, oh, nope, no, oh, no, nope, oh, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. You got any more sons? And I said, well, yeah, the kid's out taking care of the sheep. I'll go get him. So they go get the teenager. And that's David. And then in 16, he anoints him. He takes a vial of oil, pours it on his head, and he's made him anointing. So this is the anointing image that we're seeing on Jesus with the Holy Spirit coming down and descending upon him in the water. He's being anointed. That's what we're seeing. Jesus being revealed as the Christ. So Father pointed out that it's not an adoption ceremony. It's not a moment when he suddenly received the Spirit. Because that would have meant Arianism. Now, very briefly, Arian was a, he was a priest uh, from Libya, and there was two schools of theology at that time. One was in Antioch in Syria, and one was in Alexandria, Egypt, and he went to the Antioch school, but he was later a priest in Alexandria, and he came up with this idea, and he said, um, Okay, he said, Jesus, as son of God, was created by God, subordinate, this is subordinate, this. It was proposed in the early fourth century by Arius, popular throughout the Eastern region, and it went on, by the way, it went on from 325 to 843. 500 years, these people fought this heresy. Now think about it. If Jesus is not divine, you don't have a trinity. We have Unitarianism today. The Unitarian Church doesn't still believe in the trinity. If Jesus wasn't divine, he wasn't incarnate word. If he wasn't divine, if he was created, then he wasn't equal to the Holy Spirit and the, the Father. There'd be no trinity. He said, the area's basic premise was that uniqueness of God alone was self-existent and immutable. God is immutable, the Father. The son who is not self-existent, therefore is not immutable God because the Godhead is unique. It cannot be shared or communicated. So the son is mutable. Therefore, he is deemed a creature. He's been called into existence out of nothing. He has a beginning and the son can have no direct knowledge of the father. And the son is finite and a different order of existence. It would have changed everything. It got political and emperors got involved. And they started appointing bishops who supported their view. They were Arians. So the, almost the whole church was Arian at one point. There were like three bishops and one pope that fought against it. But eventually, Council of Nicaea brought all the bishops of the world together. Arius presented his program. These guys presented the counter to it. Andrew, uh, and Andrew, of, the uh, Andrew of the Desert was part of this argument. So was Athanasius. All these guys, we have their writings, and they proved that Jesus was divine, fully human, fully divine. That's why the Nicene Creed has the crazy words. 
God from God, light from true God, true God from true God, begotten, not made, co coexistent with the Father. All that is to refute Arian. That's why we say it. The Nicene Creed is the extension of the Apostles. Apostles' Creed is to believe in Jesus, Son of equal the Father. But no, we had to go through this and fight. People died over this. So that was a major thing that was going on. So Arianism is still around, but it was really a major problem at the time. Here's a book that I recommend to you. I don't have time to pass it around. I'll try to bring it next week. Written by a wonderful guy named Father Hogan. He's a friend of ours. He died. He's a priest. He had a PhD in ancient history. This whole book is covering the very early heresies. Fascinating. Still in print. Judaizers, we talked about. Gnostics, secret knowledge from the Greeks. Dualism, two gods, a good one, a bad one. My favorite, monetism. The world is coming to an end immediately. Remember Y2K? Man Manichees, two gods running everything, Arian, there it is. And Nestorius said, okay, I finally believe that Jesus is divine, but Mary is certainly not the mother of God. Well, stupid. If Jesus is God and mother, Mary is his mother, kind of logic, right? She's the mother of God. Anyway, that's those are the ones. And these are the councils. Jerusalem, 50. Nicaea is where they first addressed Arianism. Constantinople, where it was hammered home. Ephesus, when the Blessed Mother was declared the Mother of God, and Chalcedon is where it was identified that Christ possessed two natures, human and divine. Fully human, fully divine, like us in all things, but sin. Okay, finishing up, everywhere Jesus was going, even in the womb, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So he wasn't receiving the Holy Spirit. He was being anointed by the Holy Spirit. It was understood by the apostles that he was the Christ. He was the anointed one. He fulfilled the same thing that happened Samuel 10 and 1 Samuel 10 and 16. And he also, Acts says, uh, Peter in his one of his presentations says, beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. God was with him. So that fulfills Acts chapter 10, verse 37. From this, we can see that Peter understood baptism in Jesus was the anointing of the Messiah, fulfilling for Samuel 10 and 16. Pharisees saw the first five of the book as the law, and also the rest they considered part of the prophets. We have the Bible divided into the historical books, the prophets, and the wisdom literature, and the gospels. So now we see Jesus was the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7, where again, God promised the descendants of David would sit on the throne of David forever. So this is where that is being fulfilled because Jesus will sit on the throne of David and still sits on the throne of David. The throne of David is the throne of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the church. Christ is the king of the church. We saw that in Matthew 1 and 2. By the point of that, Jesus is not just the son of David, but the son of God. So there's a lot of things going on here and also fulfills the law. He is, he has the title son of God. He's anointed in the spirit. <coughs> and he's also part of the kingdom of Israel, which is kingdom of God. The new Joshua, we saw Joshua lead the people across the Jordan. We see Jesus as the new Joshua leading the people into the promised land through his death and resurrection. All this imagery, Jesus comes out of Egypt. That's why it was so important as a child, he went into Egypt because Israel came out of Egypt and then crossed the Jordan. And we see all that in Psalm 114. Unfortunately, because of all my other talks, we didn't get into it. But Psalm 114 is worth taking a quick look at. It's, it's really an amazing um, event. Psalm 114 says, when Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob, from the people of a strange language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. Remember the Dead Sea, the Red Sea parted. Jordan turned back when the Ark of the Covenant went through it. The mountains skipped like lambs, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like a ram. O hills like lamb. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns rock into pools of water and flints springs of water. This is Jesus coming to fulfill this great prophetic psalm 
that the Jews sing when they go to the temple. This is going back to the time of David that this psalm was written and it's being fulfilled. Here. So we see all these things are being fulfilled. He said, um, this imagery is coming out of 114. So this is another example, again, synonymous parallelism, where you see the same things being said both ways. Israel leaving Egypt, one event. The house of Jacob from a people of strange languages, same event. The sea looking and fled is the same as the Jordan. That's why Matthew is showing us that this wasn't just the anointing and that he was not just the Messiah. Instead, he's telling us that at the baptism of Jesus, we received the Trinity. It revealed that God was dwelling among his people in the tabernacle. And that's where we'll end. And next we'll, we'll look at Matthew 4, which is fascinating. Because you're going to see Jesus going to be, as it says, tempted. We're going to look at that in great detail. It's fascinating what happens to Jesus in the, in the desert. And that's before he, that's the end of his transition from his baptism to his, what happens in the desert, to the beginning of his public ministry in Galilee. Five, we're going to see the Sermon on the Mount. So you got to get through three, baptism, four, desert, and then we start getting the teaching. Really amazing how Matthew lays this out. So with that, we'll say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now at the hour of our death. Glory to St. Raymond of Pentafort, wise and holy patron. Come to the aid of those entrusted to your care and all who flee to your protection. Intercede for us in our need. Help us through your prayers and example, teaching to proclaim the truth of the gospel to all we meet. When we've reached the fullness of our years, we beseech you to guide us home to heaven. Live in peace with you, Mother Mary, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you. And I will see you next Tuesday evening. Thank you, Bob. God bless. God bless you guys at home. End this. Stop sharing. End.